Okay, so we are on the second and concluding part of our ceilings and floors series, and it's all about generations. So what I want to do this morning, I want to do a quick generation check um, before we get into this, all right? Now, when we start to mention generations, some things might not be in absolutes, all right, but at least they'll give us an idea we'll, so we can just try and pick ourselves out where we are in the building, okay? So let's do a quick generation check. Number one, would you rather text an explanation or send a VN. Let's see the people who will text. Let me see your text. All right, let's see the VNs, all the Gen Zs. There you go. All right, number two. Number two, did you study with, which of these did you study with for your common entrance? Common entrance. Kerosene lantern or rechargeable lamp? All right, you used a kerosene lantern. Let me see, kerosene lantern. Yeah, there you go, that's my generation. Rechargeable lamp, let's see you right there. There you go. All right, all right. Okay, number three, number three, raise up your hand. Now, be honest, if you know the relationship between those two, those two things. If you know the relationship, raise up your hand. All right, put your hands down. If you don't know the relationship, raise up your hand. Let's just see. All right, that's good. The young shall grow in Jesus' name. All right. All right, number, number four. Don't ask anybody. Don't worry, don't worry. It's not important. Number four, raise up your hand if you know what to do with this. You, you know what to do. All right, if you don't know what that's about, raise up your hand. Let's see. If you don't know what to do with it, don't even know what a VHS tape is. All right. Okay, 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 okay. Number five, number five. You had watched at least three Mount Zion movies before you were eight. Before you were eight, three Mount Zion movies. Let's see. Uh, okay, 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 okay. All right. Okay, number, number six, number six. Now, I'm asking about you, not your daddy. Did you ever own, personally, one of these? The floppy disk right there. Did you ever own it? All right, there you go. Okay. All right, let's check on the other end. Let's see the next one. Did you ever own this, ladies? Ah, how many of you watch Joker jellies? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, number seven, number seven. We're just trying to pick out our generation. That's what we're doing. Number seven, if you are more active on TikTok than on Instagram, let's just welcome you to church this morning. There you go. TikTok, POV is you are more active on TikTok than Instagram. Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. You are more active on Facebook than Instagram. Let's welcome our mommies and daddies this morning. <laughs> Wonderful. More active on Facebook than Instagram. Okay. Okay, now, 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 number nine, number nine, number nine. You've ever said this before, and please be honest, you are talking about something you saw, and you said that, and where you saw it, and then you said they put it on the platform. Let me just see if you have ever said that before. Or maybe even said in your one best platform. Let's just see if you've ever said that. Uh, okay, WhatsApp platform. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, um, um, let's do a few more, let's do a few more. Um, Okay, how, how would you, this might help us pick out our, our generation easier. How would you commend, your friend dresses up good and you want to commend their dressing. Um, if you are, oh wait, no, calm down, calm down, calm down. I'll tell your generation. All right, if you say something like, you look gorgeous, you are probably like, Janet, you are probably millennial. If you say something like, this dress is giving, uh, uh, okay, okay, okay. It's giving everything it should give. Okay, okay, okay. No cap, no cap. All right, okay, okay. Um, but if you say that, man, you've got reels, okay? Hello, Jen Alpha, Jen Alpha. Okay, okay, whatever, whatever. Whatever, whatever. Now, okay, this will help us. This will help us. This will help us. Let's do an abbreviation test, okay? An abbreviation test. So we'll start from a good place where I think everybody will be comfortable, all right? Then we'll start to see where we will get you lost, okay? So let's start. Let's put it up. Number one, everybody, PTL. Come on, come on. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I thought... I thought that was easy enough. Okay, 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 don't worry. Okay, IJMN. Hey, hey, your mommy has sent it to you now. Why are you doing it? All right, HBD. Good. IDK. I don't know. You don't know? Okay, 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 okay. OMW. So good. OMG. Come on. IYK. Yeah, yeah, you guys are good. IOY. I love you too. Um, now let's get the millennials lost. NGL. Ah, IRL. IKYL. I know you are lying. All right, all right, all right. 
right, all right. Okay, at some point you got lost. Okay, now a woman, a woman, a woman sent this message to her son. Look at this. A woman sent this message to her son. Hey, son, what do TBH, IDK, NGL, ILY, and TTYL mean? So he replies, to be honest, I don't know. Not gonna lie, I love you. Talk to you later. She replies, no problem, son. Thanks for being honest. I'll ask your sister. I love you too. <laughs> All right, now, wherever, wherever you fall in this, right, generationally, last week we learned that God is a God of all generations. And that's beautiful for us to know. And that we can only discover and live in the full purpose that he has for our lives when we are rightly connected to what is ahead of us and to what is behind us. We saw all of that last week and we saw that God's intention is for our lives to be connected, to live our lives with what we call hands on us and that our hands are also on for another generation. And we also saw that a move of God gets stronger as it passes, all right? And so we do live in the tension. I think we do live in the tension of the face of the world changing really quickly. It's like people are coming and going and our pursuit of purpose and of meaning and interpretation and all of that. We're trying to figure it out through the lens of our generations and all of that. So what I want to do today as we conclude on this series is to, I want to show you, and this is what I'll speak on for a topic, how to wisely steward generational possibilities. How to wisely steward generational possibilities. And I hope to show you this morning that from where we stand generationally, from where you stand generationally, that you can take a big, intentional, and collaborative view to live wise and purposeful. That you can take, you, from, from wherever you are in the conversations of generation, you can lift up your eyes and you can take a big view so that you can live wise and purposeful. All right, so um, as we... As we get into this in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul is trying to teach Timothy just some wisdom about how to deal with different kinds of people. So he says, do not rebuke an older man. Please look at this, but exhort him as a father. So there's a way you would speak to an older man. And then he says, younger men as brothers and older women as mothers, younger as sisters with all purity. And so what we see here is that it's wisdom for us to know how to treat different people, people of different generations, um, so as to maximize the possibilities of the relationship and of the connection. That it's wisdom for us to be able to maximize the possibilities of connection by knowing how to, he says there's a way you would deal with an older man, a younger man, an older woman, and a younger woman. I, I imagine that if today Paul was writing to Timothy, um, he would probably be saying things like, you know, don't do this to a boomer man, or don't do this to a Gen Z girl, or something like that. He's trying to say there are ways you will treat people there are peculiarities as to why we think the way we do, why we see the world the way we do, the circumstances of our upbringing, of the world in which we grew up. I kind of feel like we all grew up in the same world, but if you're honest, it's almost like different worlds. It's almost like there have been 20 worlds. They all just happen to be the same world, right? And so we grew up in different times. There were different things that have shaped um, our worldview and our life experience and, and all of that. And they leave us with peculiarities. They leave every one of us with peculiarities. There is a code that I'll shoot up, and the origin is a bit disputed, but most people attribute it to a guy called Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. He's the founder of Dubai, or the father of modern-day Dubai, and so you know everything that has gone on in Dubai over you know, the last many years, and just all that level of vision and innovation and leadership and all of that. But listen to what he says. He says, my grandfather rode a camel. My father rode a camel. I ride a Mercedes. My son rides a Land Rover. And my grandson is going to ride a Land Rover. But my great-grandson will be back on a camel. Why is that? Tough times, hear this, create strong men. And strong men create easy times. Easy times create weak men. Weak men create tough times. So you have to raise warriors, not parasites. I thought that's powerful. And what we've grown up in, what we've seen, what we've experienced has shaped us more than we think. If we grow up in tough times, there's a way we think. If we grow up in the middle of war, there's a way we think. If we grow up in a convenient environment, there's a way we think, and it shapes our lives and our worldview. And so we'll notice that how we start to respond as human beings to the questions of love and of connection, or of productivity, or of commerce and trade, or how we respond to our deepest longings for you know, self-actualization or realization, all of that. How we start to respond to our understanding of community 
humility is all influenced by the world in which we grew up in, how we were shaped. So let me try and do a little, maybe just gen generational introduction, just in, in summary, just in case you're not too familiar with some of this so it doesn't fly over your head, okay? And so um, I'll just put up on the screen just a few major generations that are alive today, okay? So you have born between um, 1946 and 1964, uh, the baby boomers who came after a generation you call the silent generation. Silent generation was 1921 to 1945, and um, baby boomers current age about 60 to um, 78. There's an old joke of a baby boomer that asked his father, who was born in the silent generation, so imagine like the 1920s there about, and he asked his father that, how did you guys cope? How, how are you not bored? There was no TV, there was no internet. What were you guys doing for fun? Like, how was life for you? What were you doing for fun? And, well, the father and his father's 27 siblings didn't have an answer. Okay, okay, all right. First service was sharper. They got it quick, but anyway, all right, all right. You guys overslept. Okay, now you have the baby boomers. Then you have um, Gen X, um, 1965 to 1980. Current age, about 44 to 59. You have the millennials, which I do believe is the perfect generation, um, 1981 to 1996. I know some of you say all of this, you're like very borderline. Like you're not, you're not Gen Z enough to be Z. You are not a millennial enough to be millennial. You just don't have generational identity, kind of confused, bro, all of that. Okay, you have Gen Z's, 1997 to 2012, current age of Gen Z's, it is perturbing to know that Gen Z's are 27 now, like it's perturbing, right? 12 to 27, Gen Alpha um, up to about 11 years now. And where I'm going is that there are peculiarities, all right? And please stay with me. This would help you in how you think about what God is doing in your life. There are peculiarities of every generation. For example, if we bring this home and we talk about the baby boomers that were born, you know, up to about 1964, about 60 to 78 years and all of that. In our own country, these guys experienced the ravaging effect of the civil war. For example, they saw division in this country. They saw a civil war. They witnessed it. They felt the emotions. And so it shapes how they think. That's why some of you during the last elections would hear your parents say they can never vote for someone from a tribe. And you're trying to say, listen to their propaganda. It's not about propaganda. There is just something on the line how we see the world because of the circumstances in which we have lived and what we have experienced. All right. Again, you have um, millennials and um, who are about 27% of the, of the world population now. And millennials are the first generation to to know a childhood both with and without the internet, all right? And so they started out without the internet. They knew just those values that were shaped as private people and what that kind of life is, you know, what it meant to have meditation, what it meant to have, you know, a life and to build some values that were before the in invasion of that kind of technology and the internet. And then they also, in growing up, started to experience, you know, the internet and all of that. And so they, they, they have peculiarities to their lives because of that kind of upbringing. And and, and world culture. Um, you have um, Gen Alpha that was the first generation that, that doesn't know a world without social media. Think about that. Do you know what it's like to not know a world without social media. You know, think about what that does for your sense of identity, for your sense of affirmation. Think about what that does for your sense of approval, your desire for approval. You don't know a world without social media, literally, right? It's, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of how you would see the world, all right? Again, you can talk about Gen Z that are currently about 30% of the world's population and how that the Gen Z's grew up in, a lot of their values were shaped in the place of an intense surge of information and of knowledge. And so they relate to the world more more as one entity, as a global village, right, than maybe any other generation. There's a lot more ease in the feel of the world because at the time when a lot of their values were being shaped, there was a lot of technological advancement and so a lot of things were more convenient, you know, things had gotten a lot better, societally speaking, and all of that, right? Commerce is a lot more customer-centered, right? When you go to a bank, you go to a restaurant, there's a lot more customer-centered, you know, customized king kind of focus and all of that, okay? And so in many ways, they are even quicker off the blast, you know, they are, they will definitely deal with a lot more fear of missing out because obviously they know the, the realities of a lot of what shaped their lives is such that when I go off for two hours, I feel like I've missed a lot. You know, I literally come back on and it's like, where have you been? Like everything has happened. Like the whole world has literally moved, right? And so I would, if I grew up in a lot of that, I would naturally deal with a lot more um, fear of missing out than my grandmother that would go away for two weeks and nobody cares, you know, um, something like that, okay? And so in many ways, as we think about it, um, this world that we all grew up in 
has shaped a lot of how we see the world. And I really want you to appreciate that this morning. And there's a reason why um, a Gen Xer, for example, and they're thinking about things like integrity and their word and what it means. Because a Gen Xer grew up in a world where when I tell you that I will come and see you in Enugu, all right, next week, Tuesday, at 2 p.m. in your office. I have to keep to it because there's no way I can cancel that appointment, all right? So if I said I'm going to come to Enugu next week, Tuesday at 2 p.m., I better be there, right? There's no phone I used to call you to tell you I'm late. There's nothing. So I will grow up to know the value of keeping my word. That would be very different from somebody who grew up in a generation where I can cancel an appointment one minute before. Literally, I'll just text you, all right, and tell you I can't make it, all right? And so when a Gen Xer is thinking about word things like I gave you my word and my value, lose and my integrity and all of that. You understand that the world in which they grew up forced them to think in a particular way, to be trained, all right, in, in a particular way, all right? A Gen Xer or a boomer would, would work a job for 35 years, all right, and retire after 35 years of meritorious service in the same place, same of same thing, right? For different reasons. One, maybe it was the world that forced them into it, and, uh, you know, forced them not to be ambitious in a particular kind of way. Why? Because, you know, how you even know the existence of opportunities? You don't even know, right? How you live to go and check who is advertised. You can't, so you sit down there, so you become a faithful person, right? You will stay there, and 35 years later, they will shake your hand and give you plaque that you have, you have, you have spent your life and retired and all of that. But, but a Gen Z person starts a job today and uses the internet of that office to apply for <laughs> another job. And at break time, break time, we'll be attending an online interview right, right now. All right, and so the world in which we all grew up shapes how we think. And that's why a Gen Xer would, would, would a lot more have this kind of stability about what they do, stability about how they think about the world, while a Gen Z would more, more likely just be open to options. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Options like, let's just test it out there. Let's test the relationship, you know, situation, you know, just, just test it. Test it out there. There's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of, of thinking, okay? Um, you can understand why, um, for example, a generation growing up where questions are being raised based on their gender identity every day, will likely question it more, right, than parents that never even heard those kind of things until one mad person from somewhere came and, you know, nobody, right, you understand? But when you live in the face of it every day, there will definitely um, be a lot more questions that you would ask. So I say all of that to say that there are definitely peculiarities that shape the world in which every one of us has grown up in and shape how we see the world. Okay, now what are we going to do with that? Because I do believe that we must wisely steward our position in every generation. We must wisely steward where we stand. Remember what we said is that we can only live our lives to the maximum if we are right connected okay so here's what we're going to do three simple ideas that I'll share with you and I'll be done this morning all right the first thing we're going to do is that we are going to take the effort for connection we are going to take the effort for connection. Connection is not just going to happen randomly because we see the world differently. Connection is not just going to happen naturally because our worldviews are different. So what are we going to do? We are going to take the effort for connection. Why will we do this? Because we know that the purpose of God for our lives in every generation will only be maximized to the extent that we connect rightly with what is ahead of us and with what is behind us, all right? So we will take the effort for connection. Look at one Timothy five again which we read Paul says that do not rebuke an older man but exhort him as a father younger men as brothers and older women as mothers younger as sisters with all people I think it's so powerful because we think many times this might just be a verse telling us how to treat older people but no look at what he's saying he's saying Timothy from where you stand know how to treat every kind of person all right there's a way you treat older people to connect rightly and get the value there there's a way you treat younger people to connect in other words it's not that I would treat older people right and younger people should learn how to treat me no it's that from where I stand I will know how to treat older I will know how to treat younger I will know how to relate across board generations so that I can maximize the possibilities of connection we will take the effort I'm trying to show you it's going to be effort to rightly connect with the people who don't see the world the way you saw it the way you see it all right we will take the effort of connection listen to Proverbs 26 verse 16 it says that a lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than several men who can answer sensibly you know there's this way we can live our lives that we we just become self-obsessed with how we see the world, all right, in our own eyes, the way it seems to us. And we become self-obsessed about that. The Bible says that is the lazy man. I'm wondering why it says lazy man. He doesn't say foolish man. He says lazy man. Why? Because to see beyond what you see in the world takes effort, all right? It's going to take effort not to be lazy, to just have this, your worldview, this, your self-obsession about how you see the world, about how everybody else is whatever, all right? It takes effort for connection. And my encouragement to you today is that you will take 
take that effort for connection. Please don't be self-obsessed in how you see the world, in how you see people, or in where you see from. Please don't be self-obsessed. Don't just be wise in your own eyes. And because of the circumstances in which you have lived and what the world has shaped you to see, please don't be self-obsessed. In many ways, we're going to find that the story of the world is like the story of, 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 of the seven men that were taken to see an elephant, the seven blind men that went to see an elephant. And each person came back saying something different. Somebody came back saying, oh, I, I felt it and it's just a wall. Somebody else came back who held the tail and said, I felt it's like a rope. Somebody else came back who held the leg, said, I felt it's like a stick, all right? Everybody had something to say. And it doesn't mean that person is wrong. It just means that you have not yet experienced that side of the world, all right? And so it's the lazy man that is self-obsessed, that believes all there is to the story is what I have experienced. If I can say to you today, please don't be dismissive. Don't be generationally dismissive, you know? When we start getting to those points where you just tag a whole generation and you just say things like, you know, all old people can never that. All young people at this, please don't be generationally dismissive, all right? It's, it's a weak way to live your life. We're going to take the effort. We're going to take the effort from where we stand to maximize our life by connecting rightly. We will take the effort to connect rightly. Now, how are we going to do that? How are we going to do it? I'll tell you the key. We are going to listen. We're going to be people that listen. Please listen. Please listen. Please have a heart that listens. Listen to generations. Listen to the sounds of generations. And please, when I say listen, listen beyond the words. Please listen beyond the surface expressions. Please listen to the heart. Please listen to the emotions. Please listen to, to, to the world view. Please listen to what it means to be in those shoes that you are not in. Please listen to people's context. Because every generation has a story. Every generation has a context. And when I say generations, I'm not even just saying like a Gen Z or like a millennial. I'm saying every side of the world somebody has experienced, every space of life gives a context. Please be the kind of person that listens. And as you listen to people's stories and as you listen to people's hearts, as you listen beyond the words and surface expressions and conclusions that people reach, please listen to the heart. And as you listen to that, please listen through the lens of God's truth. Please listen through the lens of God's standards. Please look, listen through, through what God says about the world and the purpose of God in the earth. Please listen um, to generations. Please don't be dismissive. Anything you do, please don't be dismissive of people. Don't be dismissive of generational expressions. Listen for the emotion of, because you don't know what it is to be me. You don't know. I don't know what it is to be, to, to be you. We, you don't stand in my shoes. And, and the world has shaped every one of us more than we probably admit. You don't know what it is to, 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 to look at your age and realize that, you know, give or take, I only have maybe 10 years plus-ish left on earth. And, and then my son, uh, my daughter, is now telling me that they're not in a hurry to marry or to have children. You, you don't know what it's like to be in those shoes. And so some of the things you will say, do you get what I'm trying to say? Uh, they said these old people are putting pressure. You don't know what it's like uh, to be looking at your age and comparing it with life expectancy. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You don't know what it's like. At the same time, you don't know what it's like to, to grow up in, in, in what I call real time, to grow up in a world where, you know, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, every, it's so fast. And, and you don't know what it's like to grow up in a world that doesn't even allow me to focus. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't know what it's like. And so we can't just be dismissive that, ah, why can't you be attentive? You don't even know what it's like to, to, to be in those shoes. So my, my point is, if we would listen for generational context, if we would listen for stories, for hearts, more than just the surface action, more than just the surface words, and if anything, please do not be dismissive. Uh, Jesus, what he showed us was that he always started conversations with people from where they were. Jesus would come to a woman by the well and he would start talking about water. He would come to a, a culture and he would start speaking stories uh, that they could relate with. Jesus would start conversations from where people were in age, in need, in demography, all of that. Jesus was a master of coming to people where they are. And what I'm saying to us today is that if we also realize that just like Jesus, God has called us to be an influence, to be a blessing to the world around us, to generations, uh, right, to our own generation to people around us. God has called you to be a blessing, to be an influence to, you know, colleagues, to neighbors, to siblings, to parents, to children. God has called you to live a life of influence and of impact. And the only way you would rightly connect, you're going to take the effort to connect because if you don't connect, you can't be a blessing. Are you hearing me today? If you don't connect, you cannot be a blessing. Being a blessing, being an influence starts from the place of connection. And the only way we can rightly connect is that we will listen. We will listen. We will 
would walk in the shoes of others. We would understand the context of others. We would take the effort. I call it effort because it's the lazy man that will just see the world through his own lens. Okay, so friends, we're going to have to take the effort um, to listen and to connect because in every generation, as I think about it, a friend of mine um, said this to me many years ago. And it really made an impact for me. And we're just talking about like context and cultural context, but I find that it applies with generational context and cultures and all of that. Now, in every culture, in every generation, we are, there are all kinds of things going on. But if we listen well, we're going to land at four things. There are things in every generation to receive. There are things in every generation to rethink. There are things in every generation to redeem. And there are things in every generation to reject. I'll tell you what I'm saying. There are things to receive that this is incredible. This is a sound of God. This is, you know, a generation is bringing something to the forefront and we must have the heart to listen and receive it. Even if it comes in a wrong package, even if it comes without our own style and all of that, we must have the heart to receive it, all right? Again, there are things in every generation to rethink. In other words, you are doing it in a way, um, maybe this is not the best, maybe I see the point, but we can just rethink it this way, all right? Again, there are things in every generation to redeem, which means that it's a practice, but what we're going to do is that we're going to put redemption value on it, all right? We're going to put the value of the life of Jesus on this same thing, all right? And now have it in redemptive value, who God is to us, all right? So there are things that we would redeem. And then again, there are things in every generation because no generation is perfect. There are things in every generation that we would outrightly reject, all right? Which means that this is not true. This does not hold. This is the traditions of our fathers that makes the power of God of no effect. And so we will reject, all right? And in every generation, if we listen well, there is no generation to reject. There's no generation to entirely accept. We're going to, right, see the things to receive. We're going to see the things to rethink, we're going to see the things to redeem, and we're going to see the things to reject. Let me tell you how this works. I'll give you examples, all right? Um, for example, as I think about Gen Alphas, and just that, that childlike, there's that hymn we sing during weddings that would say, with childlike trust that fears no pain or death. There's that childlike innocence, all right? And they don't know all the, ex they don't have all the experience we have, you know? When you are trying to walk a walk of faith, there is how something happened to one man in Portacot. I read one story. There's a lot that has muddled your waters, all right? But when you see this young, childlike, or it just wants to believe. It wants to dare. It just believes possibilities and all of that. And so I believe that there is a younger generation stirring up that will have an audacious faith, all right, that is pure, that is God-inspired. And what are we going to do? We are going to receive it. Please don't stifle it. Please don't play down a sound of God that is putting this raw, audacious faith in another generation. You may be too experienced for that kind of faith. You may have too much contradiction in your head, in your mind for that kind of faith, but you're going to see it in a generation and see what it's right, all right, and don't stifle it and encourage it and champion the cause of that kind of faith in a generation. But again, that same generation, you're going to find things in that generation that you would say, no, but we're going to reject this because this is perversion. This is not a God standard. This is not in accordance with the truth of God. You can't allow a generational wave that starts to tear down the values of God's word and, and say, oh, it's just what everybody is doing. No, there are things in every generation as you receive that, you'd also find, hey, here is where we're going to draw the line. We are going to reject. But how are we going to get there? We are going to listen. We're going to take the effort um, to listen. Again, as I think about that same concept, of receiving all the way um, to rejecting. I think about some baby boomers and some of that generation before me and, and how we must receive the kind of values and integrity um, but because this, this generation grew up. There's a gener My dad would tell me stories of, of what it was like growing up and how you know, they used to have newspaper stands. I don't know if you, 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 you met newspapers. Some of you don't even know that they sell newspapers. You read news online, all right? They used to sell newspapers. And so when you have these newspaper stands, right, um, what would happen is that the, the newspaper um, vendor, is it? Would, would put the newspapers in the morning, all right? And he would write the price. And he would just put a stone on top of all of them so that they don't blow away. He would write the price and he would go away. In the evening, he would come back, all right, to come and take his money. So if you want to buy, you've seen the price, you would drop the money, all right, and you would go away. He doesn't even know who bought it, but he would come back in the evening and meet his money there. When you grow up in that kind of society, there are values that shape your life. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Their values and their integrity. And friends, these are the kind of things that we must receive, we must listen for. You can't dismiss a generation that knows that and say you're just right. Because these things are built with time, with trust, with, with an emotion, with a kind of, you know, satisfaction. It takes a lot to build it. So what are we going to do? We are going to receive that. But in that same generation, sometimes you start to see that there are traditions of your fathers that have made the power of God of no effect. Are you hearing me today? 
There are traditions that start, that start to stand in the way of a thing God is trying to do. So we, again, we will draw the lines and we will reject that. And I can go on and on and talk about a generation like, like Gen Z's. And I think about how we must receive. There's a pursuit of knowledge and of truth that I see with Gen Z's. Why? Because, uh, you know, you might, you might look at Gen Z's many times at, at surface value and just feel like they're very inquisitive and all of that. But if anything, I see with a generation that wants substance. They don't just want forms. They don't just want, you know, we go to church because we must go to church. Why do we do this? You understand? Let's get to the core of the truth. And we, that's when you start finding out many of the things you have said for 20 years. You don't even understand it yourself. You get what I'm trying to say? When the right people ask you questions, do you get what I'm trying to say? So you now say, keep quiet. Why are you questioning the Lord Almighty? No, come on. We must receive that kind of love for truth. We must receive that kind of love and hunger that wants more than just a surface. I don't just want to play God games and just be in conformity, conformity com for the next 20 years. I don't want to play games. If there's a thing about God, I want it at the core. I want the truth of this experience that we are you hearing me today. So what are we going to do? We are going to receive that. We're going to receive it as a generational push that pushes us towards the truth and, and a deep love for the truth. We would receive it from a generation. Again, when I start saying there are things that we would even rethink, as I think about Gen Z's also, I think about how that there are huge questions on identity. If any generation has been attacked on identity, I'm not sure up to where we stand. I'm not sure anybody has been attacked on identity as much as Gen Z's have. There's such a huge attack. And so what the response generationally is that they're very big on identity. They're very big on what you say about me, what, what's, on, what's on social media about me, blah, blah, blah. You know, what people say. Just that, uh, trying to define ourselves. So doing all these many things to try and give ourselves identity. But the truth is this. The truth is this. They might be approaching it in a wrong way. But if we rethink that, would we think that and see the quest for identity is really a very valid quest, right? It must be at the base of our lives. That awareness of who we are must be at the base of our lives. But here's how we're going to rethink it. We are not going on social media. We're not going to the news to find out who we are. We're going to a God who holds the truth about our lives. We're going to a God who has spoken about our identity and says it's in him. So we would rethink that generational approach and take it to the right. Are you hearing me this morning? And as we go on and on that way, we're going to see things in every generation to receive, to rethink, to redeem. As I think about what we must redeem, when I look at some of my parents' generations, just from the boomers, the exiles, and all of that, there is a satisfaction in those generations, a satisfaction, you know, a satisfaction that they're not looking for, not looking for what is not lost, satisfied, right? And so... Subsequent generations came along and became a lot more ambitious. Like, I don't want to die the way my father died. You know what I mean? Like, I want to do things in my 20s, that kind of thing. But all your daddy was looking for in his 20s it was just government Volkswagen. You know, just easy, soft. Not looking for anything more than himself. Just a satisfaction. But what we're going to do is we're going to redeem that. And what do I mean? Because it's not just about being satisfied. We need to be ambitious in a godly way. But we must redeem that satisfaction and call it contentment in God. So we will start our lives from a place of contentment, a deep rest in God. Not just a rest because we lack ambition, but a rest in what Jesus has perfected for our life. And so we find rest in that. I will redeem that thing and, and call it rest in Jesus. And then I will be rightly ambitious. Are you hearing me this morning? And we can go through and through and through. And I'll show you that there are things we would receive. There are things we would rethink. There are things we would redeem. As I think about... The online influx of my children's generation, <laughs> that there is such exposure, online perversion. What are we going to do? We're not going to stifle it. We're going to redeem it. Hey, news headline, Satan didn't create the internet. Maybe you don't know. Oh, surprise. He didn't. He's not that smart. Are you hearing me? All Satan does is to make a mess of what God creates. Satan doesn't create. He only perverts. Are you hearing me? So what are we going to do? We are going to put righteous value and we'll see the gospel spread in the generation we're in and of our children more than ever before as it goes with places we could never even go. We would redeem it. Are you hearing me today? And so I can go on and on and say, but here's what we're going to do. We must think how we receive, how we rethink, how we redeem and what we reject in every generation, in every generation. All right, so we must take the effort for connection. Take the effort um, for connection. Um, let me run because of my time, but please don't stifle generations. Please don't be dismissive. Don't tell a younger generation to just shut up and not ask you questions. The questions are valid. The questions are valid. 
Even if you don't have the answers, you can point them to Jesus, who is the ultimate answer. But the questions are valid. They're asking questions to point them towards truth. And, we, and we've had this generational attitude where you just stifle and say, oh, all young people are this, all old people are that, you know. And there are things within all of that to just see how we can put redemption value on it, all right? Um, please don't despise. Don't despise generations. Okay, second thing I'm going to say, second thing I'm going to say is that we must, first of all, I've said we must take the effort for connection. Secondly, we must take responsibility for the flaws in your flaw. When I said this in first service, people that were in front, they ran out shouting. Did you not hear the, I said take response, yeah, let me give you a second chance. So, so second thing we're going to do. We're going to take responsibility for the flaws in your flaw. Oh, there you go, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you take responsibility for the flaws in your flaw. I remember growing up, and um, when we lived in a few houses growing up, um, but one of the things that was common to all the houses we lived in, they were, they were old houses. And so um, we'd move house, and it was typically good when you move in the dry season. So, you know, um, you'll just be boiling that the house is fine. Then the first day it rains. You just first start hearing, bum, 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 bum. So as you stay in the house for a while in the rainy season, you start to know all the places. Once it starts raining, you know, yeah, yeah, it's raining also. You know where to put bowl. You know where to put buckets. You know, you know the places that, you even know the places that drips over. You must put bath. You know, you know there, there, there are different, right? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, come on, don't be, don't, don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And the idea is that there were, there were flood ceilings that many times there were just leakages. Some of you are like, what's that? Eh, don't worry. <laughs> Our roof was leaking. That's what I'm saying. All right. So, so it just drips, drips, drips in different places. And, you know, last week we were trying to establish this concept of generations give us their ceilings to build our floors. And, and what we're going to find, and so we said that we're building our floors where others have built their ceilings, but what we're going to find is that where the ceilings are damaged, where the ceilings, as we speak spiritually, where the ceilings are damaged, and we are now trying to build floors on those ceilings, just, just where the world has put us. In many ways, we're going to find that the flaws that some of us stand on generationally are flawed. We're going to find that there are flaws, not, not even because of anything we did wrong, but almost just like generational positioning makes some flaws to just be flawed. That just growing up in certain things, like I said, there's just a way you see the world. There's a world you grew up in. There's a worldview you have. And just because of that, some of the flaws that we stand on are flawed. But here is my encouragement today, is that we are going to take responsibility for our flaws. We're going to take responsibility for the flaws flaws in our flaw. And if anything, I would say to you today, friends, please fight against the flaws of the flaw that you stand on. Please be in the fight. Please don't take it as a, as a limitation of your life. Don't take it as a statement of what you must live for. Please don't give excuses, living less than because of generational limitations. Please be responsible to fight for the flaws in your flaw. Please stand up to know that it doesn't matter the generation that you're in or, you know, where you started out life from or where the world has put your generation you don't have to live in the limitations of those flaws that's what i'm trying to say that's what i'm trying to say please fight against the flaws of your generation please fight there are peculiarities that shape every generation there are peculiarities that would almost position you to be a kind of person but when you start to see that it doesn't align with what god calls you to be it doesn't align with the standard of god's truth please fight why because our god is greater than the limitations of any generation the god that we serve is the god of all generations he's the God of all time are you hearing me the God that we serve is greater than the failures or the limitations of any generation so as we align with him that we can fight against the flaws that limit us in time in every generation please don't excuse living in generational limitations that you are an old person doesn't mean that you should be extinct right that you should be outdated that uh, <laughs> you know the way young people are doing things now no 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 don't live in the limitations of being old are you hearing me and again, that you are a young person doesn't mean that you have to be light, naive or lack credibility. That is just the way everybody around me, uh, around me is. That's just the way that you grew up in a generation that gives you this customized king shape, you know. Uh, that's the way commerce is. That's the way the world around is. So every bank, every restaurant, every um, supermarket is trying to give you this feel of you're the most important person ever. And all of that does not mean that you should become self-obsessed. 
It is not a validation to become self-obsessed. Are you hearing me today? The world might push you, fight against that floor. I'm not going to build that kind of life where you don't become self-obsessed. You, you walk into a church service and, and suddenly worship is no longer about God. It's all about you because I am king, all right? And so it's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. Oh, Tolu, how I feel. What happened this morning? What I'm going through? It's all about me. Come on, don't be self-obsessed. We came to worship Jesus. At some point, you have to realize this is a generational flaw. It will limit your life. Are you hearing me today? Don't live in that self-obsession that you live in a generation that is full of knowledge and of wisdom and there are new things and now you can study your Bible literally. You can open, you know, open, open um, uh, just one click. You can see every Greek meaning of every word and so you have this influx of revelation. Does not mean you should become rude to people that studied hard to know the things that they're saying. Don't become a rude person. So because you got one revelation that your grandmother did not have, bless God for her life. But now all these old people don't know anything. Hey, grandmother was faithful to God for 20 years, 50 years. And listen, you may have a revelation now on an item, on one thing that maybe she doesn't have. But listen, in the limitation of that her own knowledge, grandma said, I will, not, I will never pray without tying a scarf, as an example. So when you even want to say, ah, we're about to travel, grandma, eh, yeah, she'll run, she'll carry cotton, she'll put it on her head. Not her, she cannot pray without. Okay, now you have revelation, Abby. So grandma, who has done that faithfully, do you know the effort it takes to do that faithfully? For 50 years, to say, I will never pray, and she prays every day. The way she prays, you don't even pray that way. Every day, she has done it for 50 years. She will always put, if anything, honor that kind of faithfulness. But you now open your mouth, Inside two months of studying the Bible, to now be top, do you get what I'm trying to say? Don't let your, po your generation position you to become an unfortunate. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Are you hearing me today? Let me encourage you today. Don't let your generation make you an entitled person. Some of you grew up, and it's beautiful. You grew up in a world where technology has made things a lot better. It is good. Stand on the strength of your flaws, but please fight against the flaws of that flaw. Please fight against it. Don't become an entitled person. That everything, the world exists for you. Everybody exists for your, for your glory. Everything is to honor you. So as you walk in, all you're even assessing. So God is inviting you to a move of God, to be a part. You walk in, you can't even see yourself volunteering or doing anything, you know. Um, are they ready for me, you know? Uh, it's just about me, huh? you know, me. Huh? I don't like the way someone talk to me. I'm sorry about the talk to you, but we came to worship God. That's what I'm just trying to say. Don't become an entitled person. Everybody exists to bring you pleasure. Eh? No. No. Mm? No. Mm? Mm? You hear? No. No. See, I love it when I see people who, by generational definition, you almost say this is how they should be. But you then see them living above that. I love it when I see young people that have credibility. Are you hearing me today? Young people that will give you their word and they stand on it. Ah, I'm like, these are people that understand that you are more than the limitations of your generation. I like it when I see old people that are not extinct, that are not just giving excuses for, for ending everything. I'll still show you in a moment. Old people that it's almost like, hey, you know, back in the day, they've just become negative, they've become cynical. There's nothing you ever want to do. They say, you know, one man in a devil. Come on, let's... Fight against the flaws of the floor that you stand on. That's what I'm saying to you today, friends. We can stand on a strong floor because of who Jesus is to us. I don't care where the world puts us. I don't care what's happening in the times we live. We can stand on a strong floor because of who Jesus is to us. Who says amen to that this morning? And so the last thing I'm going to say today, um, please come on the keyboard. I'm pressed for time. The last thing I want to say this morning um, is, first of all, I've said, you know, take the effort for connection. Secondly, I've said, take responsibility for the flaws um, in your flaws. Take responsibility for the flaws in your flaw. Um, thirdly, this morning, take this, take this as you for us, not you versus us. Take this, if you haven't heard anything I've said today, I don't know why, but hear this. Take this generational conversation as you for us, not you versus us. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 17, there's a story we're all familiar with, I'm sure. 
um, and if you're not, don't worry, I'll give you a heads up. It's about David killing Goliath, and basically Goliath is this champion of the Philistines. He's big, he's bold, he's been intimidating the Israelite army for about 40 days, and just talking them down and intimidating them, and they were all freaked out. Nobody could, could go and stand up against him. He's a champion of the Philistines. And then there's a young boy called David, and Saul is the king, but Saul and all his army could not face Goliath. But there's a young boy called David who comes along and he's another generation who has this kind of audacity that God is working in, who just seems to have a voice of God on his life. There's a young boy that just believes that God can do great things, that believes in the power of the name of Jesus and it's raw. He's not, he's not contaminated by just the experiences and all that other generations have been through. And we've preached a lot about Saul and all his mistakes, but I'll show you in a moment one incredible thing Saul seemed to understand. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and if we take the story from verse 38, David is now about to go and face Goliath and he has talked Saul into it and Saul says okay I'll let you go the Bible says so Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head he also clothed him with a coat of mail and the Bible says David fastened his sword um, to his armor and he tried to walk for he had not tested them he tried to walk he had not tested them and David said to Saul I cannot walk with this there is a style of another generation I, I can't carry that I have not tested them. It's not me. I didn't grow up in that. It doesn't make it wrong. It's just not me. So David took them off. And he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistines. And so can you see David in that moment coming to Goliath, not with Saul's armor, not with the style of another generation. But Saul is empowering him to be strong in his own generational voice, to be strong in what he has perfected, to be strong in the walk that he has known with God, to be strong in the voice of God on his life, within his context. Saul is empowering him to do that because Saul understands that it is not you versus me. It is not your sling versus my armory. It is not your stones versus my weapons. No, it is me and you. It is you for us, not you versus us. Because David, if you take down Goliath, it's a victory for all of us. If you take down Goliath, it's a victory for the whole Israel, for the whole nation. It is not you versus me, David. It is you for us. And that's the understanding that I pray we would all have, that it is not you versus us. When we come to a kingdom generation conversation, friends, it is not you versus us. It is not one generation against the other. It is what God is doing in every generation for the sake of every one of us. It is you for us. Kingdom generation thinking. It's not you against us. It is you for us. Now, David and Saul show us that at the end of the day, it's not about your stones. It's not about your armor. It's not about your sword, Saul. It's about Goliath coming down. So here's my encouragement for everybody. I'm closing. Don't get petty about methods. Get bigger about purpose. I'll say that again. Don't get petty about generational methods. Be bigger about purpose. Let our conversations point to a weight that we put on purpose. Let the things that we learn to overlook point to the weight that we put on purpose. You're here today. I'm the oldest member of my life group. Well, the more important thing, are you finding Christian connection? Point to purpose. Maybe I'm the youngest person in the team. Are you finding purpose? That's what we must point to. It is not you versus. It is you for. It's you for us. And in a move of God, last week I was praying that the hearts of fathers will return to children, of children to fathers, according to Malachi chapter 4. And I really believe that. But today my prayer is for every single one of us, for our hearts to be turned to the purpose of God, to the weight of the purpose of God. Because I believe that when our hearts are turned to the weight of the purpose of God, then our hearts will be turned to each other in a whole new way. Listen, friends, when our hearts are turned to the weight of the purpose of God, when we see that God wants to bring down a Goliath, when we see that God is on the move here, God is trying to bring down a Goliath, then guess what? Every heart of David will be turned to Saul and Saul to David. Saul will start to say, how can I champion what God is doing in David's life? David will start to say, how can I come for Saul's blessings on my life? It starts to become our hearts turned to each other when we understand that our hearts are actually turned to the weight of the purpose of God in our life. So friends, today I would encourage you, let us not allow a Goliath run ravage on us. Let's not allow a Goliath start running ravage on the purpose of God, on another generation, what God is doing in the earth. Don't let a Goliath run ravage and intimidate our children and intimidate the move of God. 
God. Intimidate people trying to put their faith in God. Don't let it go out, run ravage, and make us look weak, and, you know, just pull out the strength in what we are. Don't let's allow it go out to run ravage on us. So what are we going to do? We will not allow it go out to intimidate the culture of the world and, you know, just intimidate us as a church. What are we going to do? We are all going to turn our hearts to the weight of the purpose of God. And as we do that, then we would find a turning of our hearts to each other, that it will become collaborative, not competitive. We need to turn our hearts to the purpose of God. So here's my invitation for us today, that every single one of us will be given to inspire and to champion the cause of God in another generation that will be given to it. I said to you that you would only live your life to the full when you connect rightly with what is ahead of you and what is behind you. And so my invitation is that every one of us will be given to the cause of God, to inspire to champion the cause of God in every generation. The generations before you, the generations after you, the generation around you, let your life be given to inspire the cause of God, the purpose of God. God is doing something in the earth. Put your voice on it. Put your hand on it. Put your support on it. Let your life be given to the cause, to the purpose. Let your heart be turned to the full weight. See, we need Goliath to come down. We need to see Goliath defeated. And the only way that would happen is when all of our hearts are turned to the purpose of God. Let's champion the cause. Let's hold up possibilities of what is ahead of us. Let's see a move of God. Let our influence be passed on for others. Let's live to see a move of God. It's beautiful for me, Tim. You can come. It's beautiful for me this morning as I was walking into church and seeing our junior church serving right here in our own service. It's a beautiful thing. I love to see. Every time they come to do it, I think it's once a month. They do it once a month. When they come, twice a month. When they come and they serve and all of that, it's beautiful. But let me encourage you guys. Do you know what we need to do? We need to be championing the cause of what God is doing in others and be encouraging them and be speaking strength and supporting them and saying God will use your life mightily and speaking it over them that there will be a light in a dark world that they would find their place in the purpose of God and let's be inspiring them and championing that cause in them but friends it's not just about that my last scripture today is Joshua chapter 14 because that's happening on one end of town but in Joshua chapter 14 from verse 10 you know the story of a man called Joshua he was one of the two guys who left Egypt and came in a promised land but now Caleb Caleb is 85 years old listen to his words and now behold the Lord has kept me alive as he said these 45 years ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness and now here I am this day I am 85 years old give me verse 11 and yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me just as my strength was then so now is my strength for war both for going out and for coming in verse 12 so Caleb says, now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you have heard, you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. You know my prayer this morning is that as God is moving on younger ones and we're inspiring them and encouraging them, I pray that we're also inspiring and encouraging every Caleb that it still has that swing in them saying give me this mountain. I still believe for a move of God because what God is doing in the earth today is going to be collaborative and so if all our hearts are turned for the purpose of God and say Goliath must come down we must see the mountains taken we must see God prosper his move in our day and our time and we believe that our days will be the days of the greatest moves of God that the earth has ever known what are we going to do we will champion the cause of God in every generation we will lift up the heads of those that are weary we will uphold those that are weak we will say come on go for it every Caleb we will call every young person and say go for it God's hand is on you we would see a move of God. We would see that collaborative because it's not you versus me. It's you for us. Everything God accomplishes in you is a victory for the cause in which we stand. Friends, we gather this morning, not in a story of ourselves, but we remember that 2,000 years ago, our Savior went up on the cross. He stretched out his hands wide. He died a death that he had no business dying so that we can have a life that we don't deserve to have. But it's not just about us. It's a move of God in all the earth that our Savior paid a price so that we can see every, every devil defeated. We can see God's hand upon our nation, upon the world that we live. We can see God move. He has paid a price for that to happen. And so, friends, let's give ourselves to champion the cause of what God is doing in the earth. There is enough purpose for us to lift up our eyes to. Let's not become small and petty along generational divides, but let's believe as we connect, as we take the effort to hear ourselves, to listen, to connect, that God will do what he has never done before. That there will be a stirring up of Caleb's. There will be a stirring up of the young. There will be a stirring up of everything around us. And we will indeed see God do what only he can do. 
There's a generation that is not yet born, that is crying for direction, that is crying to say, I don't want to grow up and go out intimidates my life. Friends, we can stand up to that purpose of God. We can see what from where we stand and see God, that we can believe that we will live in the days of the greatest moves of God ever. Who says amen to that? Friends, can I encourage you that we will build strong. We're not going to give excuses for the flaws on our floor. We're going to build strong. We're going to raise it up and we are going to give our ceilings for another generation. That others will come and build on what we've built. Amen, anybody? That we're going to leave a heritage. We're going to build strong. We're going to give strong lives and we're going to give it for God to prosper his purpose in and through us. In Jesus' name, who says amen to that this morning? Amen. If you're not standing, please stand. Everybody online, please stand this morning. I'm going to pray in just a moment. I want to pray for everybody this morning. I don't know where you are in this conversation. I don't know what you stand in, but I believe that there is a move of God in your life. I believe there's what God wants to accomplish in you. I believe that there's who God wants to be to you and what God wants to do through you. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning I pray. If you could just hold out your hands, that's awesome. I pray this morning, God, for a turning of hearts to the weight of your purpose. I pray this morning for people, various situations, different expressions, people raising children, parenting right now, people who are looking out for another generation, people in leadership positions, people in places of influence, people looking out for their parents, parents looking out for children. I just pray that cross border, cross generational lines, people that are just reaching out to a loved one somewhere, a friend, a relative, a neighbor. This morning, God, I pray that from where we stand, you will give us the grace to rightly steward. That, Lord, you would give us the wisdom. You give us the strength to connect right. And, Lord, that our hearts will be turned to your purpose, larger than the pettiness, larger than the smallness. Let our hearts be turned to your purpose. That, Lord, we will run in the rhythms of your purpose. We pray today that Goliaths are coming down over families. Goliaths are coming down. As we connect and as we collaborate, Goliaths are coming down over generations, over the possibilities in lives. Goliaths are coming down. We speak the victory of the name of Jesus today, that in the name of Jesus, you will build strong floors. You will live greater than the floors of, of a generation. I pray today you will live your life with wisdom in the name of Jesus. And so today, I just pray for your heart to receive wisdom, to steward the possibilities of God right around you, across generations. You receive wisdom now to know how to connect rightly, to be all that God called you to be. In the name of Jesus, you will know what to do. You will know how to do it. You would have the right interpretations to every season and to every situation. But I pray you will not come short in what God wants to do in and through your life. In the name of Jesus, now receive grace, grace to build strong, grace to stand on those floors and to raise a ceiling for generations. Receive grace, receive the blessing to be a joy of many generations. Receive the blessing to have impact, to leave a heritage for your children's children. Receive the blessing to build up in things money can buy you things money can never buy receive the blessing to be an eternal excellency and a joy of many generations receive the blessing that will make you all that God calls you to be that generations to come will rejoice in your light in the name of Jesus and everybody said amen 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 while we stay standing I love to make an invitation for somebody who doesn't know Jesus whether you're in this room or you're online anywhere, it's such a joy that you'll be with us in church today. Thank you for coming. And um, in this moment, I just want to give you a chance because, you see, Jesus loves you. He knows you. And as we have this conversation about building and what we're called to be and all of that, the truth is this. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11 that there's no other foundation that anyone can lay other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The, where our building starts is when we have the foundation, which is Jesus it's nothing we can be in ourselves. Every one of us here, we're flawed people. We're, we're messed up, every one of us, till we found Jesus. He makes the difference. And I don't know who you are or how you got to be here today, but if you don't know Jesus in a personal way, if you can't say this morning that you are born again, or whatever words you used to say, maybe at some point you had made a decision, but you know that you've walked away, you're far away from God. You're living in sin. You need forgiveness today. You need to be able to say you're on the same page with God. You need the gift of his grace today. It will be my joy, my honor to lead you in a moment. I don't want to embarrass you. I'll ask everybody to close their eyes and bow their heads. And I'm going to count to three. And where you're on the count of three, I want you to put your hand on your chest. He sees you. He knows you. Whether you're in this building or you're online anywhere, let this be your moment. Don't harden your heart on God. Are you ready? One, two, three. Put your hand on your chest right where 
you are. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. That's a miracle happening in your life. If you want to join him, please do that. That is a miracle. God bless you. And I also believe there are people online this morning. That's a miracle. God bless you. Thank you for your sincerity today. Nobody takes a step towards God in Jesus and it's a wrong step. God bless you. I see you. I see you. I see you. God bless you. That is a miracle all the way to the back. God bless you. Thank you for your sincerity this morning. You know what? This is a family, not a crowd. We're going to join in and say a prayer with you today. But I want everybody with their hand on their chest, whether you're in this building or online anywhere, say these words with boldness, knowing that God hears your voice. Can we all say together today, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I come to you today because you've made a way for me to come. Through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of your son Jesus. So I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he's the savior of the world. I believe he died in my place so that I can live. I make today the day that I confess Jesus as my savior and my Lord. Please forgive me of the past and give me a whole new start. Wash me clean in your blood. Forgive me of all my sin and all my failures. I surrender everything to follow you. I will follow you all the days of my life. Say so one day, I'll be with you in heaven. I receive your grace. I receive your love. Now say, I am loved. I am accepted. I am forgiven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's congratulate. Let's congratulate everybody who prayed that prayer. Congratulations. That's a miracle. A miracle just happened in your life, and we are so excited about it. I can't tell how excited I am for everybody who prayed that prayer. That's a miracle. You just did the very right thing and taking a step towards God. You know what? We want to serve you. It's a family of the crowd. We want to serve you in every way that we can. So if you put your hand on your chest to pray that prayer, um, once you get out of the doors after service, you're going to see some of our team around the premises. When a faith support tag, they'll be waving something like this. It's a gift from our church we want to place in your hand. It's just something to get you started. Uh, whether it's a first-time decision or you're recommitting to that decision, we just want to be able to encourage you and be praying for you. So they want to register your decision so that we can be praying for you. If you're online, wherever you are, that's how you can let us know that you pray that prayer. Please let us know you pray that prayer so that we can serve you in every way, get you strengthened, established, and just be praying for you in every way that we can, all right? And if you are contemplating questions about your faith, trying to figure things out, please feel welcome to also walk up to any of our faith support volunteers. They would love to serve you in every way that we can, all right? But one more time, let's say congratulations. Some people just prayed the best, made the best decision of their life. Let's congratulate them this morning. Amen.